The reading for the seventh Sunday of Epiphany is from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. But someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you are planting. Then God gives it a new body he wants it to have. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. The scripture tells us the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, and then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like earthly man, and heavenly people are like heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel for this Sunday is from the Gospel of Luke, the sixth chapter. Jesus is preaching to a couple thousand people out on a plane, and this is what he says. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks, and when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting them to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will be acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, or it will all come back against you. Forgive others, and you will be forgiven. Give, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. The gospel of the Lord. Well, let's pray. Oh God, let the words of our mouths and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength and the one who saves us. Amen. So, who for you is beyond forgiveness? It might be somebody you can think of right now. Depending on your political party, we're probably all thinking of somebody but not the same person. That would be my guess. It might be somebody who lived a while ago. It might be somebody that you have heard about or seen on the news. We can all think of people who don't deserve forgiveness. And indeed, there are people who are so wicked that we need protection from the criminal justice system to keep us safe. When I think about who doesn't deserve forgiveness, my mind goes first to Adolf Hitler. 
I don't know about yours. Then it goes to ISIS and Boko Haram, and it goes to Al-Qaeda. It goes to people who molest children or people who murder other people, serial killers like Genghis Khan or Ted Bundy, people who I think are beyond forgiveness. When Jesus talks about loving our enemies and forgiving people, I think our tendency is to go right to those worst people ever, right? I go right to, well, Jesus, you can't mean that because what about Hitler? And I think what Jesus wants us to do is stop and think about, first, the people close to us. Look at someone sitting next to you. That person is a sinner, and they're looking at you and thinking, well, you're a sinner too. Our tendency is to think of the worst people because we can let ourselves off the hook for Jesus' commands then. If we can say, well, everybody, Jesus is right, we should forgive everybody, but not Hitler, that lets us say, but there's a hole in Jesus' words so we don't have to actually live them out. So what I want to encourage you to do is to start closer to home. Start with that person who's sitting next to you or your children or your parents or your siblings or your neighbor who parks partly on your driveway, or the person in the car next to you who's just driving slow and annoying the heck out of you. Um, Sorry, it's my issue. Um, Think about those people and ask yourself if you can forgive them. Now, I have people, I have a person in my life, and I've said this before, whom I, well, I hate. Um and with really good reason. And so I don't want to forgive. And we all have people like that too. People we don't want to forgive, people we don't want to love. But when I don't forgive, when I don't love, the person it hurts is me. I'm the one who carries the weight of that. And the person I'm thinking of is dead, so I can't ever actually reconcile with him, not that I would want to. But I'll tell you the truth. When I think about Jesus telling us to love our enemies and to forgive one another, this person always comes to my mind, and I say, I can't forgive him. And I say, I don't want to forgive him. And that's where I'm stuck. And so my prayer, and it's working actually, my prayer is, God, make me willing to consider forgiving, right? I might not be able to forgive him before I get to heaven, but I can do what I can. I can follow Jesus' instructions. You see, Jesus is talking about a radical reconceptualization of how we love and who we love and how we're compassionate and how we're generous and how we live lives that echo and image Jesus to the world because that's what we're called to do and Jesus Jesus forgives. Think about the time in which Jesus lived and the people to whom he was saying this. He was saying it to Jesus, to Jewish people under Roman occupation. So they were being brutalized by Roman forces and Jesus said to them, if somebody slaps you, turn the other cheek. Now Jesus didn't say that so that we would all go around thinking that we deserve to be abused or that we need to allow ourselves to be abused. Jesus said that because if you get slapped by a Roman soldier and you turn the other cheek, what happens is that Roman soldier is going to have to think for a minute about what he's doing to you. You are taking away his power to hurt you by turning the other cheek. Jesus says if someone wants to take your jacket, Give them your shirt also. So, um, Keith, if I said to you, I love that checkered shirt. Yeah, right, you're gonna wrap it tighter around yourself. (laughs) But I know that out in the gathering space, because you heard these words of Jesus, you're gonna give me that shirt and your t-shirt too. No, really, don't do that. (laughs) Don't do that. (laughs) Right, but that's what Jesus is saying. Don't, don't let anybody steal your power away from you, your power to love and forgive and be compassionate. Jesus, 
wants us to do some really radical things. I want to just talk through some of the things in this passage in Luke. Jesus wants us to um, love our enemies. He wants us to share generously with one another, even if it hurts even if we don't think we'll get paid back. Now, if someone came to me after church and said, at the last service and said, I can't pay you back, but I want $1,000. And actually, I knew him, and I said, you could pay me back double. Um, <laughs> so it doesn't count. But, that, but I want to just tell you, that rationalization, you see, is part of what Jesus is warning us against. The rationalization that says we don't have to be generous, we don't have to be compassionate. Jesus can't possibly mean this literally. So we give generously. We, um, we turn the other cheek. Then Jesus told us the golden rule. This is the only law that seems to... Um, encompass all religions, um, whatever you want somebody to do to you, that's how you should treat them. How you want to be treated, you should treat other people. Sometimes it's hard to do that. When we look at each other with fear and suspicion, it's hard to want to be generous and kind in our feelings toward another person, but Jesus calls us to do that. Um, then Jesus says, if you, to love the ones who love you, that's easy peasy. Anybody can do that. Everybody does that. If somebody loves you, you love them back. If somebody's kind to you, you can be kind back. But Jesus tells us that God is kind to everybody, the good people and the not so good people, or the good people and even the bad people. God is compassionate. Compassion is a really interesting word in this context because it's a word that means having passion with somebody. It means that you can feel the heart of the other. So when I have compassion for you, my heart reaches out to you and I understand how you're feeling or I understand what you want me to hear about how you're feeling. Compassion is more than just feeling sorry for somebody. It's more than just holding their hand. It's sharing a heart together. And that's what Jesus calls us to do. Then Jesus says, um, the really hard one, I think, here, the one that just makes me want to slam my Bible shut. He says, and don't judge. We, as human beings, are so likely to divide people into groups, the good people or the bad people, the people who are Christians or the people who aren't Christians, the people who share my political party and the people who don't, and we tend to demonize the other right? If I look at somebody who doesn't agree with me, I'm going to think you are wrong about that, whatever the thing is, right? Because I have to be right. I'm sorry, but it's true. Uh, no. <laughs> but we need, we need to be compassionate toward one another, and we need to not judge. So when you find yourself saying, um, that person, it can't be a Christian, Tell yourself this, God never gave me permission to decide that. When you tell yourself that person is evil and beyond redemption, tell yourself God never gave me permission to decide that. Judging belongs to God and not to us. Now, I have to walk a little tightrope here and I'm just gonna be honest about it because you could go away and say, well, there they are preaching about peace and love and everybody get along and nobody be mad at anybody and it's frou-frou pie in the sky, buy and buy stuff and once again, we didn't get any instructions about how to live our lives. Well, I'm giving you instructions. <laughs> Jesus said, love your enemies. Jesus said, forgive the people who hurt you. And Jesus meant it. And Jesus wants us to love others. And so it isn't pie in the sky by and by because the fact is this is where the rubber hits the road in our lives. If we are unforgiving and bitter, if we are angry, if we are holding hurts, the person whose life those things destroy is us. If I am angry and bitter, that hurts
Now, I'm not going into the depths of how we feel about the people who are the really bad, unforgivable people, because we don't have to start there. I'd like you this week to start with the question of who is it hard for me to forgive and love right now in my life? And I don't mean Nancy Pelosi or Donald Trump. I mean somebody in your life somebody you live with or know well who has wounded you. And if you can't forgive them, ask God to help you forgive. And if you don't want to forgive them, then ask God to help you want to forgive because God is with us in this life journey. Jesus invites us to a life that is rich for us and he ends this passage by talking about if we give and we share with others, it will be given back to us. This is not the Joel Osteen kind of giving. I went to Oral Roberts University. I know that theology very well. It's not the kind of giving where if I give $100 to God, God's gonna give me back 100,000. No, if I live a life of rich generosity of spirit, of pocketbook, of lifestyle, then my life will be richer. So this week, Look at who you can love, who you can turn from an enemy to a friend, who you can turn the other cheek to. Amen.